Welcome. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Pensacola. My name is Paula Montgomery. My pronouns are she and her. And I've been a member here since 1984, I think. <laughs> long time, long time. Anyway, it's a source of great happiness to me to see you here today, to welcome you. I'm so glad you're here. I also want to welcome the people who are not present but are watching on streaming. And so welcome, welcome to the, you other people that are out there. Uh, this is a place where you're welcome, whoever you are. This is a place where truth is sought, not doled out. Where you explore your spiritual journey alongside amazing, courageous people. And where you don't just talk about the world, you work to make our values come alive in this place, in Pensacola and beyond. This is your house. Your name is on the doormat. Welcome home. Now, I invite you to be at ease. This is your house. Think about the values we share as we watch together the video of our eight principles, remembering that love is the power that holds us together, and it is the center of our shared values and principles. Opening words are adapted from Rebecca Parker. It's called Your Gifts. Your gifts, whatever you discover them to be, can be used to bless the world. The mind's power, the strength of your hands, the reaches of your heart, the gift of speaking, of listening, of seeing, waiting, imagining, any of these can be used to serve the hungry, to bind up wounds, to welcome strangers, to praise what is sacred, to do the work of justice, to offer love. You must answer this question, what will I do with my gifts? We're ready for our chalice lighting now. I have asked Angela to assist me. May the light of this flame illuminate our tradition of seeking, invite all who yearn for acceptance, and ignite our passion for justice and for peace. As is our custom, when someone who is a member or friend of our congregation passes away, we light a memorial candle. This candle is for Mary Ann Kelly, who was an honorary lifetime member of this congregation, and she passed away this last week. Light the candle, yeah. No, thank you. And I invite you to stand for our hymn, our opening hymn, which is What Wondrous Love Is This from the Gray Hymnal number 18. And at the end of the hymn, you'll remain standing for our covenant. Oh 
Love, love is the spirit of this church, and service its love. This is our covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. You may be seated. Thank you. We now have a time for all ages. It's called the old man and the boulder. Do any of the children know what a boulder is? Let's see. What's a boulder? A big rock. And the rock, the rock in this story is bigger than I am. I mean, it's enormous. Once upon a time, there was an old man and he lived in the village where he had lived all his life. He lived on the very edge of it, and he had a beautiful view. On one side, there was a gorgeous mountain, and on the other side, a green forest. And he loved to sit in the sun and enjoy the sound of the birds. But the thing that gave him the most joy was he knew all the people in the village, and they walked by him on this road that went right by his house when they went to market or when they went to another village somewhere. So that was his favorite thing. The birds were fine, the sun was fine, however it was the people that he really loved. So one day there was a loud crack and an enormous boulder fell down and blocked the road where the people walked by. No one was hurt, but they had to go by a different route to get to market or to get to uh, another village or something. And so the old man didn't have the contact with the people that he was having, and it made him very sad. So he decided he would move that rock. He got up, he put his cane to one side, he stood by the boulder and he pushed and pushed, and he couldn't move it. And a little nine-year-old boy who was a friend of his came and said, I'll help you, I'll help you. And so together they pushed and they pushed, but they couldn't move that boulder. It was enormous. So the little boy's mother came and she had a baby strapped on her back, but she also helped to push and push. The people in the village saw what was going on and they missed being able to talk to the old man. So they all came out together and said, we've got to move this boulder, this just won't do. Some of the men got big planks and they put it under one edge trying to lever the boulder up and all of the people together pushed and pushed and the boulder rolled into the forest away from the road. And everyone was so happy. They were dancing and singing and having a wonderful time. Now, now this is a story that sort of has a moral. I was wondering if any of the children could figure out what the moral is to this story. Do they know what moral is? They may not. There's, this story has a, a meaning to it, something that you should learn from. Okay. If you don't, if you don't, if you're too shy, I'll tell you, it's not a secret. Things that are very, very difficult sometimes take a great many people working together to get them done. And if it's done with love, it is a great celebration. And now it's time to sing the children out, and I want to change a word in our song that we sing. Normally we sing, go now in peace, go now in peace, blah, blah, blah. This time we're going to sing, go now in peace, go now in joy, and may the spirit of love, and so forth. And when you sing it, smile, big smile. It changes the whole way you sound. So, are we ready? solely supported financially and otherwise, as you noticed this morning, by our members and friends. 
And as you give so generously of your resources, we are grateful. It is time now to share your financial resources as you are willing and able. The offertory song is called Strange Fire and was written originally by the Indigo Girls. voted to support Just Pensacola about five years ago. Many of us have actively participated in what, what has been going on since then, but there's some among us 
who have joined more recently and don't understand what it's all about and how it works. Today we're honored and delighted to have their chief organizer, Tricia Wessel, to explain a little and tell us about the achievements of this unique group of which we are a part. Tricia is new to Pensacola. <clears throat> she comes to us from an academic background at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, which gives her discipline and depth and communication skills. She's much more than her academic background. She also brings a deeply held value for fairness and justice. After the service, I hope you will get to know her informally during the coffee hour after we have our brief meeting with the host of the, part of the uh, house meetings. Tricia? <clears throat> Hello, everyone from Unitarian Universalist Church. I really thank you for inviting me today to share the Just Pensacola vision of justice ministry and to learn more about your congregation and I hope all of you. In case you have not met me yet, I am Trisha Wessel. My pronouns are she and her. I am the new lead organizer with Just Pensacola. And yes, I was a college professor of psychology and education in Wisconsin for about the past 23 years. Prior to now moving to here in Florida and taking on a new career in the field of justice ministry. So yeah, that does probably seem like a pretty big change and I agree it was a serious career change and a serious life change. When I meet with you, as I may do with many of you in the years to come, months to come, um, I will often ask you a question like, what keeps you up at night? What makes you angry? And I myself feel like if I'm going to put people in that situation, I should share that of myself. And I actually have a story, that um, a personal story that, I, that not only makes me angry, makes me very angry actually, but um, over the past few months, I've come to understand that I think it may have been one of those reasons that I was motivated to make such a significant change in my life. So, my 20-year-old daughter, Bella, she grew up with two amazing friends, Miley and Margo. The three of them have been friends together since first grade. Bella has been fortunate to have her to have them in her life because she struggles quite badly with severe social anxiety and depression from time to time. Um, so much so that she spent very little time actually in school through all of her years. Um, Miley and Margo, on the other hand, are very, very outgoing um, individuals, but they always had time to hang out with Bella. And over the 15 years, they've been just wonderful friends. So this all changed on February 17th of 2023. Miley was home and said goodnight to her parents, Jim and Vanita, and went upstairs to go to bed. Well, Miley did live a little bit more of life, you could say, than Margo and Bella at times. Um, she had purchased what she thought was a sleeping pill and purchased it from someone who I'm sure sold drugs. That's what we understand. Um, the pill had more to it. It was laced with fentanyl and Miley was dead when Jim, her father, went to check on her that next morning when she hadn't woken up. So even 18 months later, um, this takes me right back to that moment when I had to find a way to explain to my child that Miley was gone. I still feel that pain and anger and the loss of, for my child and for her parents, Jim and Vanita. Um, that loss is insurmountable. This world at times has become a place that I don't recognize um, and it makes me angry that not only do kids and adults seek out different ways to cope with the pains of life, but they also have no idea sometimes what they're getting. This death is painful, but it's actually more challenging to me to know that we are without Miley's 
passion, her energy, her joy, and light that she brought everywhere that she went. When Bella and I were visiting with Vanita, Miley's mom, just before we moved, Vanita had asked me about my new role. And we both agreed that this role would fit Miley to a T. She would embody everything that we do in this work. So something that truly, I think, drives me to do justice, to change the systems in this world and to make this a healthier world for all of us would be thinking of her and thinking that there is some meaning going forward with this you know, horrible reality. Um, also though, to not have others go through what Miley and her family have experienced. And I do this work knowing that Miley is a part of me and a part of that spiritual world that is with me and kind of pushing me to fight the injustices for the people of the community. So I wanna be clear that the fight, or my fight, is to focus on injustice in any facet and not just for the self-interest that I shared. Of course, I want to rid this world of fentanyl for street use, but I, I value the structure that we have here at Just Pensacola and how we come together as 17 different congregations of Pensacola to decide together what injustice we will fight against. So I do wanna take a moment to kind of talk about our vision at Just Pensacola, especially for those of you who are new to Just Pensacola, or just to remind us all again why it is that we come together to do this. Um, we at Just Pensacola find inspiration for our powerful justice ministry from our UU principles, specifically, and actually after revisiting them again this morning, you can really find it in all eight, but specifically we'll look at that second principle in particular, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. We can divide our congregation's ministries into three powerful areas when we think about this, faith, mercy, and justice. So when we think about faith and faithfulness ministry, we tend to do that really well. Um, I see all of you here today, and many of us are doing that, that coming to church every Sunday, um, the walk that we have ourselves with our God, that can be a very individual, weekly, daily um, event. Then, of course, our mercy ministry. Again, I just heard of a few of the things that were happening here at the UU Church, and I look around in Pensacola, and there are so many people working together to feed people who are homeless, to shelter people who are homeless, to talking of the family that just adopted a dog from the shelter. We are helping people and all of our creatures, you know, where they're at at that time. We do mercy ministry really, really well. Then we get to the idea of justice ministry. And this is where we hold our decision makers in our community, the mayor, the county, the school board, the city council, accountable for the fair treatment of everyone, especially those people on our margins, our elderly, our poor, and our children in need. And the UU principles are clear that justice is a core commitment. However, we tend to do a poor job with justice because these systems are quite big and as individuals, that's tough. The systems are big, the systems have great power associated with them. As individuals, we don't have that power to engage all of that by ourselves to be successful. So then we might ask, well then, why do this? Well, because we are called to engage in justice and we actually, when we create, that large justice ministry network, we really can achieve great change. So here is usually where I would talk about something from the, a story from the Hebrew scriptures, and you can still look it up. Um, it's Nehemiah chapter five. But um, as, she, as I found her to do, Paula from the very beginning has been a great advocate and always seems to kind of set me up for success. So when I was listening to the discussion this morning of the old man and the boulder, I realized at that moment that, well, I don't know if she set me up on purpose, but it was a great setup in the sense of 
we can use that story to actually reinforce this idea of justice. That old man, when we think about that, when we think of someone being older, we often think, well, okay, we're less able to do what we might have been able to do, say, physically before in our lives. Um, but then we even brought in the little boy who would be full of vitality and vigor, but yet even just the two of them couldn't move that boulder. But yet when you brought that entire community together, and if you look at the story of Nehemiah bringing all the people of Jerusalem together, then sure enough, you could move the boulder. When we are thinking about this in terms of just Pensacola, I'd like you to think of the boulder as the mayor or the county supervisor, or commissioners, um, or the school board. Those would be the boulder. And it's really hard for any of us to do that by ourselves. But our takeaway from the story of the old man in the boulder is the idea that he shows us the power of justice ministry. That essentially, when you think about that boulder, the old man could have engaged in like faith ministry in that moment. He could have turned to the idea of like, well, I'll just, you know, you know, pray with my spiritual faith and I'll, you know, just kind of keep doing my own thing. But again, wouldn't have had the community, wouldn't have been able to engage with people, all the things that he loved to do. He could have turned to mercy ministry and maybe the people would have come to him from time to time and tried to help him out. But it just, it, it didn't, solve the real issue there. It was everybody coming together in that moment to move the boulder. And as a result of that, they all had that sense of community. So basically we want to understand that we are needing to build that power together as people and to push back on injustices that are happening in our community. So the old man in the boulder truly shows us how building great assemblies can create great power. In this case, you know, moving this huge boulder. Um, and this is what, how we engage in justice ministry. And we honor that idea of equity and justice and compassion for the people in our community. So we know that power through this, we, we have an understanding at least of one, but we, we actually have this acknowledgement that power is actually created from two sources. We often see power with organized money and we see power with organized people. So as a nonprofit organization that is financed essentially by the wonderful people of Escambia County and all of you in these congregations, we do not have an abundance of money. But as we reflect on the story of either Nehemiah or the story of the old man in the boulder, we can see the power of organized people and make systemic change by bringing all of us together and taking our message to the people of power, the mayors, county supervisors, all of them with what we have. So we build our power by joining with other congregations under the banner of Just Pensacola, and together we exercise our power to do this justice by turning out, I'm intending, 750 people to a great Nehemiah Action Assembly to win justice in the spring. So we at Just Pensacola are tasked with building our great assembly of people and of our congregations to turn out average worship attendance once a year at our Nehemiah Action. We show up 52 times a year for our faith ministry. We need all of us to assemble one time per year for justice ministry. So if you ever hear me say 52-1, that's what I'm referring to. It's kind of our little scaled down vision. So the reality is we also have tools and that's why I'm here to talk about this and that's why I'm really here to be excited about all of your house meetings that are gonna happen in the fall. Our tool is our justice ministry network and that's what you're all gonna be building this fall, re-engaging this fall. Um, that is who we are at Just Pensacola. We are the formal network of congregations that is called to engage our entire congregational community one time per year for justice. And the way we set up this tool for all of us. Uh, we have responsibilities that are quite clear and few. So one, we bring at least three people to the Nehemiah action. Each of us 
brings three. We hope you can bring as many as you want to, but we'd really like you to commit to three. Two, we attend the three other Just Pensacola meetings per year. So the Community Problems Assembly on November 21st, the rally next spring, and then the celebration that follows the Nehemiah action. So those four events. And then three, we do ask that individuals, as what we would call a network member, that they contribute about $200 a year themselves or a, a number, an amount that is meaningful to you. That is how we want people to see that. So with those, essentially it brings together this overall justice ministry. So to kind of wrap up the vision, I do take from um, the words of Pope Francis. I found his book, Let Us Dream, to be a really inspirational book. And in his words, we need to feel again that we need each other, that we have a responsibility for others. We can reorganize the way we live together in order to better choose what matters. We can work together to achieve it. We can learn what takes us forward and what sets us back. We can choose. So we at Just Pensacola can choose to succeed in our vision to turn out average worship attendance for our great assemblies to challenge the injustices in Pensacola and Escambia County. And as we choose this strength for our network, we will increase our congregation's capacity to powerfully fulfill the UU commitment of justice and equity. This will move Pensacola in an upward spiral, becoming more and more like the community we want for our children, our neighbors, and all the people of Escambia County and Pensacola. So I want to thank all of you for having me here today. It is actually an honor to be here and to spend time with all of you. Um, however, I am not fulfilling you know, my responsibility to justice, equity, and compassion in our human relations unless I engage you and your congregation in working with Just Pensacola to fight and change these systems that are hurting the people of Pensacola and Escambia County. I take my call to do justice very seriously, and I hope that all of you will be at a house meeting this October. Paula Montgomery, Lauren Anzaldo, and Scott Satterwhite, Barbara Wright, Penny Fent, and Nancy Hagman are all team leaders in this congregation, and I'm very excited for them to be. I hope you all will work with them to attend a house meeting and to engage as a network member with Just Pensacola. I'm here to support you and to guide you through your kind of call to do justice. And you can reach out to me at any time with any questions that you might have. I am part of this shepherding of all of us to justice. So because of the amazing people of Just Pensacola, including all of you here, um, we were able to get the state attorney to implement a juvenile civil citation program. So in 2021, there were over 461 children who were arrested in Pensacola and Escambia County. Since its implementation, 300 fewer children have been arrested as a result of justice ministry leading you know, to this law. I think fewer children being arrested is priceless and it's hard to think of children being arrested, but um, that's a wonderful reality that we're decreasing that. While it's priceless, the county does actually estimate that each arrest costs approximately $4,500. So that is a financial cost savings of $1.3 million every year because of doing justice. I still kind of lean more towards the, the human factor, but that is a reality that our powers that be take into consideration. So this January, I have very good news, this past January, January 2024, the state attorney implemented the program that was promised during your 2023 Nehemiah action. Escambia County now has an adult civil citation program in part because of the work that all of you did by coming together and holding these officials accountable. Not only is she putting it into Escambia County, but she is going to has plans. I think there's one other county that it's already up and running, but all four counties in District 1 will have an adult civil citation program as a result of the work that all of you have done. So, yes. 
I was not here, so yay for all of you. Um, on top of that, the mayor of Pensacola is approving and putting forth projects that include affordable rental housing units in the, yep, <laughs> in the 30 to 80% average median income. I encourage all of you to pay attention to that if you're reading articles in the paper um, or just hearing them in the news that you wanna watch for that average median income. Some of the housing projects that are going up do not look at that 30 to 80%. Many of them will be like 80%. Um, and just to give you an idea, 80% to 120% can start at like $2,300 a month. That is not affordable in, in my, my uh, understanding of that at all. So we really want to focus on that 30 to 80%. And he is going forward with some of those projects. They involve the Motor Lodge project, and there are three projects at the Old Baptist Hospital that are now slated to have units that will be in that 30 to 80%. So we need to make sure that that's continuing to happen. So he also stated at the Just Pensacola Summit in May that he is aligned with us. And while we still have a ways to go with affordable rental housing, as long as we fully engage our congregations and bring more to engage in justice ministry with us, we will increase our power in the years to come and be able to hold our officials accountable for affordable rental housing. This is definitely a long-term project that we have to persevere through. I have no doubt of this, that we will do this as long as we engage and work together. So here we have essentially one and a half paid employees and the rest the rest of the people making this happen are everyday folks like all of you who are out there doing justice. I want to be really clear about that. You all are the ones doing this out of a call to do this. So we will have our listening process kick off tomorrow, Monday night, September 30th at the right place at First United Methodist Church. And this is for all of our team leaders. We will have our house meetings in October that again, I hope to see all of you there. And I hope to see you all then to follow up with this for our community problems assembly that will be on November 21st at First Presbyterian Church in Pensacola. This will be an exciting evening where we will take stock of how many people of Pensacola and Escambia County we are able to bring together to build our network and democratically decide what will be our issue campaign for the year. I encourage you all to become network members as you all have a great group of team leaders who I know will work hard throughout the year to shepherd each of you and build relationships to build our power for justice, equity, and compassion. We are a low cost organization that creates change through building the power of organized people and we build our numbers in all of our congregations. As we do that, we will continue to improve the quality of life for all of us. Um, I'm excited to do this with all of you and I look forward to building this beloved city of justice, compassion and equity here in Pensacola and Escambia County. So thank you for having me here today. I hope everyone who is invited to a house meeting will come. The reason for the house meeting, one of the reasons is to find out from you by listening what the, what the things are in, that need change, what the injustices are. So be prepared to get a phone call and be invited. Um, please stand for our closing hymn. I'll invite the choir forward. The Teal Hymnal 1015.
seated while I extinguish the chalice. We extinguish this chalice with these closing words. Go now in peace. Go now in joy. Go with resolve to seek justice. And may the spirit of love surround you everywhere you go. Thank you.